a Jesuit, a Dominican, and a Franciscan were walking along an old road debating the greatness of their religious orders. Suddenly, an apparition of the Holy Family appeared in front of them, with Jesus in the manger, Mary and Joseph looking over and praying over him. And so the Franciscan immediately fell on his face, overcome with awe at the sight of God born in such poverty. The Dominican fell to his knees, adoring the beautiful selection of the Trinity and Holy Family. The Jesuit walked up to Joseph, put his arm around his shoulder and said, so have you thought about where to send him to school? (laughs) Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the February gathering of the Jesuit alumni and friends of Detroit. My name is Marty West. My association with the Jesuits began in kindergarten at Jesu School, followed by U of D Jesuit, where I graduated in 1966, along with seven other 66 grads that are here today, as well as my continuation went through Marquette University, which became my alma mater in 1970 and 72. So whenever I do something really stupid and my wife gets on my case, I simply turn to her and say, Pat, blame it on the Jesuits. (laughs) We're trying to make this a little lighter program this year in honor of our, this lunch, in honor of our speaker and his topic. So bear with some of my corny jokes today. For those of you who are here for the first time, the mission of our group is to host three gatherings per year for the purpose of creating informal networking for those who have had affiliation with a Jesuit institution or ministry or who are interested in learning just more about the Jesuit ministries in the Detroit area. We hope to provide a unique opportunity to hear Jesuit-focused speakers and to be encouraged to a deeper commitment to the motto, the Jesuit motto of men and women for others. And surprises of surprises, we are not a fundraising group. That being said, however, We hope when you do receive a solicitation from your respective Jesuit college, high school, parish, or retreat house, uh, these luncheons will have reinforced your loyalty to those institutions. We are not in competition with them, but we try to complement them. Now, as we mentioned at previous luncheons, we are proud to be associated with the Jesuit Friends and Alumni Network, sometimes referred to as JFAN. Which, is, which originally started back in Europe and has now uh, compromised to similar clubs in Cleveland, Chicago, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Washington, D.C., Cincinnati, and lately we just had a club join in Traverse City, and I think there are two people here from the Traverse City Club. Raise your hand if you're here, because if anybody has a cottage up north, there they are in the back. See them, they know they have a program once a year up, up, up north. Uh, and there are efforts to start clubs in Los Angeles, Miami, Omaha, and Vancouver. Now, I've been a member of the Jesuit Alumni and Friends of Detroit Steering Committee for several years, and I recently made the mistake of raising my hand when they asked for a chairperson to succeed Mary Gressens, who, along with Frank Brady and Father Gary Wright, has done a fantastic job founding and getting this organization off the ground. Um, There's a Jesuit priest named Father James Martin, S.J., whom some of you may remember from his appearances on the Colbert Report, and he is considered a rock star among Jesuits. He's quoted as saying the following about Father Michael Tuath, our guest speaker. Mike is one of the funniest people I know, a Catholic priest He regales his friends with clever stories, boasts superb comic timing, and has perfected an inimitable deadpan look. Mike was a popular professor at Fordham University, where his lighthearted sermons attracted crowds of students to Sunday Masses. It is nearly impossible to be downhearted or discouraged in his presence. But Mike's contagious humor wasn't always valued. And 40 years ago, the Jesuits had an odd custom that make this clear. 
At the time, the young Jesuits in training were required to publicly confess their faults to the men in their community as a way of fostering their humility. This had been a long-standing practice in many religious orders, especially in monastic orders. So, for example, at a weekly gathering of the priests and brothers, a young Jesuit might confess that he hadn't said his evening prayers or that he had nodded off during a particularly dull homily or that he had said uncharitable things about another person in the community. This was supposed to help the young Jesuit become more humble, more attentive to his shortcomings, and more eager to correct them. On top of that, each Jesuit was supposed to confess things privately to the head of the community. So one day, Mike, who was known for his high spirits, felt guilty. Early in the day, during Mass, he couldn't stop laughing about something that struck him as hilarious. He felt he had been acting silly and undignified. So Mike walked into the office of the head of the Jesuit community, an elderly, stone-faced priest with a well-earned reputation for seriousness, and Mike took his seat and pre prepared for his admission of guilt. Father, he said, I confess excessive levity. The priest glowered at Mike, paused, and said, All levity is excessive. <laughs> In some religious circles, joy, humor, and laughter are viewed the same way. The crabby priest viewed levity as excessive. Excessive, irrelevant, ridiculous, inappropriate, and even scandalous. But a light-hearted spirit is none of those things. Rather, it is an essential element of a healthy spiritual life and a healthy life in general. When we lose sight of this serious truth, we cease to live fully, truly, and as a whole. Indeed, we fail to be holy. So please welcome me, welcome, join me in welcoming Father Michael Tuith by Sea, the Society of Jesus. Well, thank you so much for coming to this. What a wonderful turnout. And thank you for inviting me to speak. I, I feel very honored. Uh, I've given a lot of speeches, but I think this is the most elegant room I've ever given a speech in. It, this is something. Um, yeah, I, um, I want to begin with um, an incident that happened to me oh, a couple months ago. Uh, and you might have had the same experience sometime. Uh, I was uh, attending Mass with several other Jesuits. And I was asked to give the first reading, so I did. I read the first reading, and then, of course, I also followed with the responsorial psalm. And I turned to the group and said, our response is, the Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. And then I turned and went, the Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. <laughs> I wanted to say, could we come at that again? Maybe a little more feeling there? And that's kind of how it works, and it shouldn't be like that. And so what I want to talk about today, I'll, um, yeah. and also I warn you ahead of time, oh, I also I need to put on my reading glasses. Oh, there we are. <laughs> uh, this, this talk at different times might get a little irreverent, okay? Prepare yourself. But reverence has never been a big value in comedy. So <laughs> there you are. So, but I want to talk, I'll tell you, I've got uh, four things, I think, or five. Five things I'd, I'd like to talk about. First, just about the joy of the Christian message. And then secondly, especially the New Testament concept of joy. Then I want to go into a thing that I've uh, 
created. It's five different patterns of comedy, because I've taught comedy for many years, both at, at Regis College in Denver and at Loyola in Chicago, and finally at Fordham. I've taught film comedy, television comedy, and I used to teach a course called Comedy and the Christian Vision. So uh, I'm familiar with comedy. So I've come up with these five basic patterns that I think show up in the Gospels, and I think we can also apply to our own lives. And then finally, uh, well, then something on comic techniques in prayer, even, that we can bring to our prayer. And then finally, uh, as I said, rejoice in the Lord almost always. I'd like to talk a little bit about prayer that we have in difficult times. So that's what we're going to hear. Um, first of all, um, um, that, that uh, jolly fellow Friedrich Nietzsche <laughs> once is supposed to have said, um, let it go. If you Christians truly believe that you have been delivered from damnation and ultimate disaster, then why aren't you happier about it? <laughs> and I think that's very true. The message of Christ is supposed to make us joyful. Now, I know personalities differ. Not all of us are effervescent or giddy. Uh, we're not Kelly Ripa, you know. Uh, and but but I think we can adjust. We, some of us may be more serious, but we can do comedy. And then situations differ, of course, in our lives. Uh, as Ecclesiastes says, there is a time for mourning and a time for rejoicing. And Jesus even says, "Blessed are they who mourn." So that's in there too. But. Um, But the second, yeah, you know, I'm having trouble reading my notes. The second of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that are talked about in Galatians, the first one, of course, is love, and the second one is joy. It's kind of important. And as we well know, um, Christ said in John's Gospel, I have come so that I have told you, pardon me, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. He says that at the Last Supper, not the most joyful time ever. And then in John's first letter, he says, we are writing to you to make our own joy complete. So there you are. We're supposed to be joyful. We're supposed to be happy about this whole situation. And then especially in the New Testament, uh, lots of instances, especially in Luke. Uh, just think of John the Baptist in his mother's womb, Elizabeth's womb, when Mary comes to visit her, carrying Jesus. And John the Baptist, as we know, danced in the womb. He was very excited and very happy about meeting the Messiah there. And then Mary, of course, her response is the Magnificat, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And then I, I love to think about the joy of the shepherds, the news that was given to the shepherds when the angels appeared to them when Jesus was born. And they're kind of stunned by this array of angels singing glory to God in the highest. And the angel says, do not be afraid, for I bring you news of great joy. So, you know, it becomes kind of clear there. And then, um, the one more time in the last discourse there, as I already mentioned, that he wants us to have full, be full of joy. So there's a lot of that in there, you know. Uh, there's loads of occasions where the word joy is used and they mean it. Um, but I'd like to go into these five basic patterns of comedy and how they appear in the gospel. 
and then how you can apply them to your own life as a follower of Christ. The first one is the element of surprise. And we go all the way back to the basics, to that little jack-in-the-box that you think is just a box, and then bingo, springs open, surprise! <laughs> it's the jack in the box. Or Cinderella, all these fairy tales like Cinderella where the prince goes around to the kingdom trying to putting glass slipper on all the noble women. And then along comes this woman from the scullery, from working down the scullery, and she comes in and the glass slipper fits perfectly. Surprise! <laughs> and then there's two stories I love. Jesus all the time was surprising people, as we know. But one, I think, in particular is when Zacchaeus, the tax collector, is looking for Jesus. Jesus is going through town. So he climbs up in that tree to look down so he can get a good view of Jesus. And then Jesus stops at the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to have dinner at your house. Surprise! <laughs> and then even better, one of my really favorite stories is two of the, the resurrection appearances. I'm sorry. <laughs> A lot of them are really comic. Uh, I think of the one about the, uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday. They've left Jerusalem to go to this town. And they're walking along, and they're very discouraged. The phrase they use is, we had hoped that this would be the Messiah. But clearly, it didn't work out. So they're very disappointed. They're very downhearted. And along comes this stranger. And he walks up to them and says, what are you talking about as you walk along here? And one of the great lines in Scripture, they turn to Jesus and say, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened this weekend? <laughs> Jesus knew what happened. He was there. He was there for it. And he goes, no, no, tell me what happened. <laughs> and so they tell him all about that we had hoped that he would be the Messiah, and it didn't work out. And he says, well, you know, it seems to me that the prophets predicted that it would kind of be this way. And then he went on to explain all the prophets to these disciples. And they go, oh. And then they, they come to the inn where they're going to stay. And I love it. This is the phrase. It says, Jesus made as if to go. Okay, bye guys. Have a great life. Okay, see you. And they say, no, stay with us. Abide with us. Come to, to dinner with us. So he says, well, okay, I guess I will. And they still don't know who this guy is. And so he sits down there. And then he breaks the bread. Surprise! <laughs> and they say, oh my God. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and then as soon as that happens, he disappears. That's a funny story. <laughs> and then the other one I like a lot is about Jesus coming up to Mary Magdalene as she's weeping at the empty tomb. And he comes up to her and Mary thinks he's the gardener. That's what it says. John said, I don't know, was he wearing overalls or, you know, <laughs> did he have a pruning fork or what? Anyway, he says, uh, why are you weeping, lady? And she says, well, they've taken my master away. We cannot find him. If you know where he is, please tell us. And he just looks at her and he says, Mary. And she looks up. She goes, oh, Raboni. She recognizes him. What I like to add, but it's not in the gospel, is Jesus turned to her and said, no, Raboni is the gardener. <laughs> I'm Jesus. <laughs> but John the Evangelist had better taste than I do. Uh, and I think we can, we can apply this to our own lives. And just... Don't try, we should not try to control everything. We should be open to being surprised at things. Sometimes a good surprise, sometimes a troubling response. But be open to the element of surprise in our lives. Then secondly, a phrase I call the downfall of the serious, the pretentious, 
and even the dishonest people. And it goes way back. Moliere, Shakespeare, they all had these occasions where people were too serious and got brought down to earth. And I think of characters like, well, in the Marx Brothers movies, Margaret Dumont. She always plays this wealthy high society woman who's very pretentious and very condescending. And Groucho uh, woos her, he flirts with her a lot, but everything he says is an insult to her. So she has to deal with that. And then I think of, um, uh, Fr uh, think of MASH, the movie MASH especially, but Frank Burns and Margaret Houlihan, Hot Lips Houlihan, remember she was called? They took their jobs so seriously in the Army. Uh, they were very uh, diligent. And they thought that Hawkeye Pierce and all his buddies were being flippant and foolish and much too playful for their jobs. And they had to put up with that all the time. But finally, one time it happens in the movie that Frank Burns and Margaret Houlihan have a relationship. And it's not good because they're both married to other people. But they, they have this relationship. And one time when they're having some intimate moments, their conversation gets broadcast on the public address system to the entire camp. <laughs> the downfall of the serious there. Or I think also, of course, of Animal House, Dean Wormer. <laughs> Remember him? So serious. Everything, and he really hates the Animal House guys because they're just crazy. They're, they, they're foolish. They're silly. Well, if you recall, at the alumni parade, <laughs> when the Animal House guys join the parade. They destroy the whole parade. He finally ends up getting knocked off the platform where he was, and he's downfall of the series. So I think of, like again, uh, in the Magnificat, Magnificat, Mary says, he has put down the mighty from their thrones. The downfall of them. And then two stories I, I like a lot. When Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector, to come, follow him, and Matthew throws a big dinner for him, and he invites all his friends, all the other dishonest tax collectors gather for this dinner. And the scribes and the Pharisees walk by, and they say, well, if this man were really a prophet, he would know who he's hanging out with. And Jesus says, turns to them and says, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I'm hanging out with the sick. Complete reversal. And it makes me think of that great line of Pope Francis where he compares the church to a field hospital to heal the sick. Complete turnaround. And then the other story, the woman with the ointment. Again, Jesus is at a dinner He's with, with Simon the Pharisee, who's invited him to dinner. And lo and behold, this woman who, as the gospel says, had a bad name in town. Uh, she comes in, and she goes up to Jesus, and she starts weeping at his feet and then pouring this ointment on him, on his feet. And you can imagine at the dinner like this, people are going, what is that? wonderful smell, that smell, that aroma, that's wonderful, where's that coming from? And they say, oh my God, it's coming from Jesus. No, it's coming from that woman there, whom we all know. Uh, and again, they, uh, Simon the Pharisee says the same thing, if this man were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman is touching him. That's what they say. And again, Jesus, I love this phrase, Jesus turns to Simon and says, Simon, I have something to say to you. It's like the principal calling you into his office there. <laughs> and he says, Simon, you know, when I came in, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't, uh, and this woman hasn't stopped washing my feet with her tears. Uh, you didn't give me a kiss. This woman's been kissing my feet all the time. And you didn't anoint me with oil. She's poured this oil all over me. So... Who do I like better? 
Again, the serious, the powerful. Uh, so I think a lesson we can learn from that is not taking ourselves or our lives too seriously. Uh, the, we have to look at the absurdity in life every now and then. And things are just foolish or um, just uh, crazy. And I tell a story. This happened to me about three years ago. I was having lunch with a fellow Jesuit and his niece, a wonderful young lady. And uh, I we were having dinner, and shortly into the dinner, I spilled, I don't know, spaghetti sauce, I don't know what it was, or chocolate on the shirt that had just come back from the cleaners. And I just went, oh, I hate my life. <laughs> that became a phrase between Giovanna and me. She always would see me after that and go, do you still hate your life, Mike? <laughs> How's it going for you? And I go, yes, I do. I still hate my life. So exaggeration is a good technique for this sort of thing, too. And so then the third one is the value placed... No, it's the fourth one, I guess. The value placed on innocence and childlikeness. I think of all these wonderful characters like Tweety Bird. My favorite cartoon character is Tweety Bird. Remember, he's in the cage, and he's just very innocent, and he's having a nice day. And then Felix the cat gets up near the cage. And Tweety Bird says... I thought I saw a putty tat. I did. I did. I saw a putty tat. <laughs> and blissfully unaware, and Felix can never destroy him. Or Roadrunner. I think of Roadrunner. Beep, beep. Roadrunner running along, and Wile E. Coyote tries desperately to destroy him. And he never makes it. He just sails by, kind of oblivious, really, of what's going on. And he survives. Uh, uh, I'd like to, again, there's a few stories about that too. My favorite one is when Jesus sends out the 72 disciples out on a mission to heal people, to drive out demons and so on, and they come back after that, and they're so excited. They said, this was great. We actually did heal people. They listened to us. We drove out demons. This was terrific. And Jesus raises his eyes to heaven and says, Father, I thank you. What you have hidden, pardon me, Father, I thank you. What you have hidden from the learned and the clever, you have revealed to the merest children and these dumb people. <laughs> That's supposed to be a compliment, I guess, but doesn't come across that way very well. And then the other story like that, is, um, well, just Jesus saying to them, um, do not worry about what you're going to say when you get hauled into the courts. The Holy Spirit will take care of you. He will give you the words to defend yourself. So don't worry about it. Just be innocent. So I think we can do that, too, with humility, okay? Okay. Just realize, okay, I am an idiot. Uh, I am a mere child, and I'm, I'm pretty innocent, actually. I'm pretty naive. And just be humble about that. And then finally, just trust. Trust in God that your heavenly father or your heavenly mother will take care of you. He or she <laughs> wants even more than you want, wants even more happiness for you than you do. So trust that. And don't try to, don't worry about these things. Again, like Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, look at the birds of the sky. They, they do not reap or sow, and yet God feeds them. And the flowers in the field, they don't make clothes, they don't weave, but God puts them in glorious clothes, more glorious than Solomon. So don't worry. If God can take care of the birds and the flowers, how much more is he going to take care of you? So just trust him. And I think that's really important to do that. 
And then the fifth one is the threat of, I call it the threat of danger combined with confidence in the ultimate victory. And I think of all the slapstick comedies we've ever seen, the guy up on stage or the guy in the film who slips on a banana peel, you know he's going to be all right because it's a comedy. Or um, Abbott and Costello. Every situation they got into was dangerous. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, for one thing. But somehow or other, they get through it. They always get through it. So, and we know that in the audience. We know there will be ultimate victory, even though it really looks bad right now. And, uh, and I think of a movie recently, the movie The Hangover. Did any of you see that movie? Where these guys go to Las Vegas. And their first night there, they have a wonderful time. And then they wake up the next morning having been drugged. And they wake up, and one of them has lost a tooth. He doesn't know how that happened. Another one has a baby. He didn't know how he got that. The other one has a tiger in the bathroom. And I think they've lost all their money, too. I think that all went away. I mean, it's a bad situation. But it all works out in the end because it's a comedy. Okay, and then every episode of I Love Lucy, okay, totally gets in trouble every single episode and somehow or other survives every one of them. There's a lesson there, okay? So I think when you're in those situations which are kind of dangerous, just ask God uh, for courage and for trust and hope that it will work out somehow no matter how difficult it looks. And then finally, a reversal of previous values or assumptions. Every joke is like that. For instance, I think of the one about Brian, this Brian fellow who is sleeping, and his mother comes in and wake him up and says, Brian, you have to get up. He says, no, why? She says, you have to go to school. Okay, you have to go to school. He says, oh, well, I, I don't want to go to school. All the, all the teachers hate me, and the kids make fun of me. She said, Brian, you have to go to school. You're the principal. <laughs> kind of a reverses things a little bit. And I think the story of a... Jesus, uh, there's two stories that I like a lot. Um, oh, wait, I skipped a couple of stories I wanted to tell. Okay, we're going to go back to danger. Okay, there's two episodes that happen. Remember the one, the stilling of the storm, okay? There, the apostles and Jesus are out in the boat, and a storm, a big storm comes up, and Jesus is sleeping on the boat. And so they wake him up, and they say, they say, let me get the phrase right, does it not matter to you that we are going to drown? Or does it not matter to you that we are going to drown? And so they get up, and Jesus calms the storm like that. And Peter's pretty impressed. So a little later on, there's another episode in the, in the Lake of Galilee where uh, Jesus comes walking to the boat, across the water, he walks on the water. And Peter, who generally is the fool in most of these stories, he says something stupid so that Jesus can correct him and teach everybody. So what he does, of course, he says, oh, this is great, Jesus, let me walk towards you on the water, okay? Let me do that. And Jesus says, okay, come on. <laughs> So he gets out of the boat, and he starts walking. And it's sort of like Wile E. Coyote. Remember when he goes off the cliff, and he finally realizes, oh, my God. <laughs> and he falls down that long pit. And at the end, you hear a little poof at the end. <laughs> well, so, so Peter was there saying, oh, my God, I'm walking. I'm going to drown right now. And he does. He starts sinking. And Jesus goes over to him. And I love this image that. A Jesuit taught me. You try to imagine that scene and imagine Jesus taking Peter, grabbing his underarms, and pulling him up very slowly 
out of the water. Don't worry, Peter, you're okay. Those are great stories. So when you're in danger, just rely, believe, hope, and believe it, and trust in God. So again, back to the rehearsal, reversal of previous helpings, assumptions. Uh, I love, again, Peter, um, the washing of the feet at the Last Supper. Jesus, knowing he was from God and he was going back to God, nevertheless got up put a towel around himself, and started to wash the disciples' feet. And Jesus said, and Peter said, you are not going to wash my feet, Master. You're not going to do that, okay? And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. And Peter goes, oh, well, then wash all of me, okay? All of me, wash me. A little reversal of assumptions there. So I think... Again, in our own life, we should be willing and open to changing our opinions about things, our values, our assumptions about everything. And I know you can give me loads of examples of that. So that's how that can work in your life itself. Then I want to suggest some comic techniques even in prayer. The three types of prayers we usually talk about, the discursive prayer, the contemplative prayer, and the mystical prayer. Uh, the discursive prayer, when we're pretty much talking to God. And Ignatius Loyola says that in the uh, spiritual exercises, he should talk to Christ exactly as a friend talks to a friend. So very familiar, very comfortable with Christ. And just talk to him about everything. And again, you can think, oh, I had a bad day, a crazy day. That was crazy. Talk about that. Talk about uh, some difficulty you're having. How are we going to get through that? And, and then, and, you know, whatever you, want, uh, whatever you want to feel about God or Jesus. Um, even anger. It's okay to get angry at God. I remember one time many, many years ago when I was still in theology, and a group of us used to go out to high schools. This was in the 60s. Uh, And so we went out to high schools, and we gave retreats where we we would show audio visuals and play popular music. We were so cool. (laughs) We really were. And those were very nice. And anyway, it was time to go for another one. These two guys were out in the car, and they honked the horn. It's time to go, Mike. We have to go. And I said, oh, well, let me get my notes. I couldn't find my notes. I looked desperately for them. I couldn't find them. So I turned to God, and I said, God, I'm doing this for you. Could you help me out a little bit? And I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit down in my chair, and I'm not going to get up until you show me where those notes are. (laughs) And I start to sit in the chair. I'm not even seated, and I look over at the radiator, and there are the notes right on the radiator. So I got up. I said, okay, God, you and me, all right? We're okay? So it's great to do that, to get angry at God, to question God, all of that stuff. Uh, And again, you can use exaggeration. You can use understatement. You can use irony if you want to. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Boy, I'm really loving this. Thanks for the flu. I really appreciate the flu that you gave me. Just be ironic and sarcastic. All that stuff you can do. Because he's your friend. Jesus is your friend. Then secondly, the the contemplative prayer, which Ignatius uses a great deal in the spiritual exercises, as you probably know. They're called contemplations, scenes from the life of Christ. And he wants you to imagine them. Picture yourself in the scene, that you're observing him healing somebody. Or maybe you're being healed. Maybe you're being told to stand up and walk. And you've been paralyzed for about 30 years. And he asks you to get up. What must that feel like? Or to be like Peter when Jesus raises him up out of the water. 
what does it feel like? Use your imagination and use your feelings, express your feelings, and talk to Jesus about all those things. Um, just put yourself in that scene. Um, and again, they can be funny. They can be surprises again. They can be role-playing that you're doing. It could be dangerous situation. It could be a serious problem. Deal with it, okay? Imagine Jesus helping you with this. Then thirdly, the mystical prayer, what we call the unitive prayer, which is just quiet awareness. You're in the presence of God. You're surrounded by God's love. And you just stay with that. You take a passage from scripture like, um, help me, Lord. Uh, heal my blindness. Something like that. Words from scripture, just a phrase. And just keep repeating that. And it gets deeper and deeper in your prayer. Um, and again, some of those can be kind of comic. You might say something like, uh, why me, Lord? Okay? And just keep repeating that. Why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? That's a, kind of a mantra there. Or you can say, uh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> you aren't serious. This is what's happening in my life. You're, you've got to be kidding. And then thirdly, I love the phrase, um, why aren't we having fun yet? <laughs> this is supposed to be fun. And again, those can be humorous. They can be, as I say, irreverent even. But they, you just go deeper and deeper with that question, with that feeling. And then finally, prayer in difficult times. That's the hard part. That's where I have the title, Rejoice in the Lord Almost Always. <laughs> okay. um, a serious illness that you've been diagnosed as having, or a loved one, or the death of a loved one, of course. A financial disaster, failures, disappointments, all of those. What do you do in those situations? Well, first of all, I think you've this happened to me also many years ago. I was talking to my spiritual director, and I was telling her that I was afraid of something. I don't remember what. And she said, well, Mike, what do you do when you're afraid? I said, well, I, I pray for courage. She says, why don't you just feel the fear for a while? Why don't you just feel it, wallow in it a little bit? Because you may be learning something about why you're fearful of this or why this has been so difficult for you to deal with. You might learn something from that. And then turn to God and ask for help. And I think, again, the most perfect prayer in the, in the Gospels, to, uh, prayed by Jesus, of course, he's really good at that, at prayer, uh, at the garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus does exactly that. He kneels and he says to God, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. And he's sweating blood at the time. And I remember years ago there was some doctor who said, one can actually uh, uh, break blood vessels if you're really afraid enough, if you're really disturbed enough. That can actually happen. So Jesus was obviously very scared, very frightened, very worried. And he says, could you let this pass from me? And then, of course, the perfect answer, but not my will, but yours be done. And that's a great prayer, I think, for all of us to say when things are not going well. Help me, God, if at all possible, but your will is more important than mine. And then there's all these psalms you can read, loads of them, what they call the Lamentation Psalms. And I'll name a few of them. I'll identify a few of them. Psalm 5, Psalm 13, Psalm 22, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Psalm 28, Psalm 31, and so on. 
and almost all of them describe a desperate situation that this person is in, really helpless, really down in the pits. But it always turns about halfway through the psalm, and it says, thank you, God, for listening to me. Thank you. for I trusted you, and you came through. You helped me. Those are great prayers to say, those psalms. And uh, then the second thing I think is important is advice I give to people when they're suffering a loss of someone. Don't isolate yourself. Find loved ones to be with. People you love, people that you know love you. Be with them as much as you can. The temptation, of course, is to isolate yourself. Uh, I don't want to bring everybody down. Uh, I'll just stay around. I'm, I'm no fun to be around. No. Be with people who surround you with their love. And then thirdly, do not lose hope. Trust in God. And God will come through. And I think particularly of a saint you may not know very well, a Jesuit named St. Joseph Pignatelli. He was a provincial, I think, in Spain at the time that the Society of Jesus was suppressed in 1774. And for all intents and purposes, everybody thought, well, that's the end of the Jesuits. That does it. And uh, he became kind of the, the superior general in exile. He took a lot of the Spanish Jesuits, put them on ships, and sailed around the Mediterranean, and nobody would take them in. They finally got to Rome, and Rome let them in. But shortly after that, Napoleon marched into Rome, so they had to get out of there before he killed all of them. And uh, they, they walked, I think, 500 miles to go somewhere else. I mean, they had serious troubles. And uh, he had many reasons to, to despair and give up hope, but he never did. And there's a wonderful prayer he wrote. And I just can't believe he was able to say this prayer. My God, I do not know what must come to me today, but I am certain that nothing can happen to me that you have not foreseen, decreed, and ordained from all eternity. That is sufficient for me. I adore your impenetrable and eternal designs to which I submit with my whole heart. I desire, I accept them all, and I unite my sacrifice to that of Jesus Christ, my divine Savior. I ask in his name, in his infinite merits, patience in my trials, and perfect and utter submission to all that comes to me by your good pleasure. Amen. Is that a good prayer or what? And we were restored, of course. The danger passed. Forty years later, we, we were restored. And good comedy. Turned out fine. Everything was fine. Uh, so I, um, I'd like to close with a couple of things. One is something from the Old Testament, which I love, and I've used this as a mantra myself, actually. It's a story from, from um, uh, Nehemiah, prophet Nehemiah. And it was a time when one of the scribes, Ezra, gathered all the people together and read to them the law, the whole law. And it took almost all day to do it. And he noticed after a while that everybody was crying. Maybe they wanted him to stop. I don't know. But they were crying. So he said to them, Today is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be sad and do not weep. Go, eat rich, rich foods and drink sweet drinks, drinks and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened this day, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. I love that phrase. And I'd like to end, as I began, with a responsorial psalm. It's one we're pretty familiar with. It comes up often in Mass, the, the refrain, 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I like to change that a little bit. I say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's really enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you very much.